Okay. okay. So now we've got three, two, one. Okay, um, we're talking to Chandra Gould, author of um, Beaten Bad, which is a new study of um, the life stories of violent prisoners. Tell us a little bit about how you came to be uh, working on this topic. So I guess really it's giving, because of the curiosity around violent crime in South Africa, I guess the question that really troubles most of us in South Africa is why is crime so violent and why is our society so violent and who is behind this violence? There's a lot of talk about violent criminals as kind of other to us. They are somebody else. They're not part of our society. They are these interlopers, if you like. But when I myself was a victim of crime, when I was attacked in 2006 by three men and stabbed, the one thing that struck me very strongly is how young one of the men was who was involved in that attack. But not only his age, um, when I'd interacted with him the day before the attack happened, the one thing that was that I remember more than anything else is looking into his face and thinking, this is somebody who's never experienced love. Um, you could see the neglect on his face. You could see it in his clothes. You could see that he came from a really difficult place. And I needed to understand for myself what led him into that attack. That's really interesting because I think most people when they think about you know criminals coming at them and threatening them I mean their main reactions are, are either fear or anger and you're talking about in a very different way you, you you seem to have not just become overwhelmed by those two emotions I mean you seem to be actually interested in who the person is like who is who are these individuals that are threatening you um, and I think that that's really interesting because in a way your book is is about that it's it's about asking that question not just um, you know uh, what crimes did they commit you know it's not it's not a CSI type uh, uh, study of, of, of how these people came to be caught doing terrible things it's it's an attempt to look at how they came to be the people they are and their life stories um, so how did you go about actually getting these stories so it, it was a very long process and a difficult process because I knew that if this research was going to have any traction, particularly amongst policy makers, it was very important that it be done in collaboration with the Department of Correctional Services. But it took about three years to secure permission to go and to secure the partnership with DCS to get into prisons because it's a long and bureaucratic process, but you, one will understand that in that process I lost my funding, I regained some funding, I lost it again. So it was a very difficult process to get going. Um, but eventually in 2010, the DCS granted permission for the study to go ahead, but more than granted permission, went into a partnership with me to do this research. Um, and I requested permission to do the research in the two public-private partnership prisons for two reasons, three reasons really. The one is that it, these are two maximum security facilities, so they're where the most violent criminals are held. They're also um, two facilities where people from all around South Africa are held, and I wanted to make sure that I was able to speak to people of different age groups, different racial groups, different language groups, different provinces, because I think it was also really important for me to get the experiences and life stories of men who had grown up under apartheid and spent most of their lives uh, under apartheid and then people who were born also in the early 1990s um, and who were young uh, during the transition because I wanted to see if there was a difference in those narratives. What, one that's scary going into a maximum security prison with these predators. Not at all. Uh, tell us about that. I mean, I think most people would be uneasy walking into a place which is really a collection of, 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 of people who are known to be very violent to other people. There were moments, particularly at the one facility where... So at the one facility, um, the men are kept, you will never enter into a large room where there are lots of prisoners. Um, there's lots of open space, it's open and outdoors, they're big gardens, so the 
inmates are spread out over the facility so you don't get the sense of being threatened. At the other facility it wasn't like that and there were times that we would be walking down a corridor with many, many men surrounding us really, going about their business, yeah. doing what they were going to be doing and sometimes that could feel quite threatening, particularly mm. as women. Mm. But it, I think what is perhaps interesting is that the moment that um, you enter into an individual conversation with a person that has committed this kind of crime, their crime disappears into the background and you're speaking to a person. And I was very careful actually, at first I did this unconsciously and later it became conscious and that is that I wouldn't ask the men that I was interviewing what crime they had committed. Mm -hmm. And I also didn't go and have a look at their prison records before I interviewed them. Mm -hmm. So I would allow it to emerge and as I say, at first I didn't do this consciously, it happened that I just forgot. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, oh gosh, I didn't look at what that person <laughs> did. And then I thought, okay, and then I just went on with the story from where were you born and where did you grow up and what happened at school and so on. And then eventually, right at the end, we'd get to, it would almost become an uncomfortable question. So what are you here for? Yeah. And they, by that stage, also didn't really want to answer <laughs> it because here is this construction of a person and now yeah. you need to do. But, so for example, one of the men I interviewed had, um, had, raped, strangled and murdered three children um, and I only knew that at the end of his story and in some ways that was protective. It meant that I didn't have the judgment of that crime and it also meant that um, my fear, my, any fear that I might have had was put at, at a distance. But he was the least frightening person I spoke to, um, actually, in the end. So give, give us a sense of, of one of these stories that were, that were significant for you. All right. One story sticks out in, in particular, and it is the story of a, of a man who um, was born in, in one of the townships around Johannesburg. But before he was e six, his mother was a domestic worker, so she wasn't able to be at home with the children during the day and she couldn't afford childcare. And so she sent him to go and live with uh, her sister and her mother um, in a small village in the northwest, on, on a farm in fact. But he wasn't wanted and he wasn't liked particularly by his aunt or his grandmother. And his aunt and his grandmother would get quite drunk over the weekends mm -hmm. And they would say to him, you're going to just end up like your father, who he never met until he was an adult. His father was in prison, in fact. And um, he also had a very violent cousin who over the weekends would beat up anybody in his path when he was drunk. When he was 10, something very strange, a weird incident happened. So he and his mates were out playing in the felt and, an air, and they saw that an aeroplane, a light aircraft had... Um, fallen out of the sky essentially and by the time they got to it it was still smoldering and there were injured people lying around and further first at first they thought well let's see if we can what's going on here mm -hmm. i don't know if they thought they would help or not but help never came into the conversation mm -hmm. and he said they found a bag of money twenty thousand rand and a whole bunch of guns <laughs> and so they took this and they went home but it wasn't a day because of course he was he was a 10 year old boy who's going to be bragging about this mm -hmm. And when the neighbor, a man, so it wasn't terribly long before um, a neighbor, a male neighbor of his, he bragged to this guy about having a gun um, and the man took it from him. But having, that having a gun immediately gave him the sense of, po of power of what it means to have a gun. Anyway, this guy, um, introduced him to criminal activity and started teaching him how to rob, uh, which he did. By the time he was 16, he was still at school, but he had um, he shot one of his schoolmates in the stomach for flirting with his girlfriend. So he'd already become somebody who had neither empathy, um, nor did he have any barriers to using violence to secure whatever it was that he felt he needed to secure, whether it was his honor, 
or whether it was material possessions. He felt rejected by his mother. He thought he, he didn't understand why his mother didn't want him, because, and that's what he said to me. His mother had kept his sister um, with her, and he said, but why doesn't she want the boys? The whole, everything he was exposed to as he was growing up was about being unlovable, being a nobody, being unseen, and these are themes that Until came up again crazy and again. Gift falls from the sky. This exactly. bag of money and guns. Exactly. And it's a really fascinating, kind of striking story because of of, of that element. I mean, yeah. the element of, of of neglect. I think that's that's something that that in fact is far too common mm. in South African society. Um, and so, at the age of sixteen, he he ended up shooting someone in a minor. Uh, dispute. Absolutely, but I mean it didn't end there because yeah. he never got convicted for that. Mm. Nothing ever came of that. Mm. Um, and this was the experience of many of the men I interviewed. Mm. They would commit quite serious crimes that would mm. never be picked up by the criminal justice system at all. Mm. He left the small town and he went to back to the township mm. and um, from then his life becomes very fast-paced, filled with adrenaline, but at the same time completely unstructured. Mm. So he would hang around with groups of guys who would commit crimes together. Mm. Farm attacks, so-called farm attacks, mm. house robberies, they would mm. rob people in the street. It, they were quite indiscriminate. Mm. Um, and it was opportunistic. Mm. So whatever was available, whatever they saw, they would use it as an opportunity to get some money. But I think what's interesting, because every time I present these stories, I get asked two questions. The one is, so why, but you can't, you are giving a story that uh, excuses their behavior. Surely there's individual choice involved here. Why didn't he make a choice not to use violence is a question I get often. And the other question is, um, so first let me deal with that question. I think when asking that question, question, there's a sense in which conscious decisions are made by pe young men like this to use or not use violence. But one of the things he, one of the men told me struck me in particular when I asked him about this. He said, you know, if you go to church, then you're going to meet other people at church and you're, the friends and the people that you hang out with will be people who are at your church. Mm. When you're like me and you hang around the tavern or you hang around in the township not having anything to do, mm then the other young people that, or the other people that you encounter are people doing exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. So and so an it's easier to get in yeah, than to get out. And, and also norms within that of social course. group, that he's following the norms of which particular subculture. Um, and I suppose the other issue that could be raised is that, you know, in telling the story in a way that is quite sympathetic, um, this, the, the, the thing that people might be concerned is missing is the story of the, of the victims and their suffering and losses, um, and, and, and the real questions around that. But it seems something really interesting in, in moving away from this idea of just seeing perpetrators of violent crime as a problem to be eliminated, as, as people who should be locked away and the key thrown away, or people who should be hanged, just taken out of society at all costs and never be allowed to return. Your, your, your stories come up with something else. What is it that they come up with? What is the, the, the different way of thinking or the alternative set of solutions that come out of these stories? I think centrally it is that we can't wait until crime is being perpetrated to react as a society. We actually have to address the structural, social, cultural, whatever it is the condi that conditions are. And when I mean cultural, I'm not talking about racialized culture. I mean, I'm talking about South African culture that normalizes yeah. violence and enables violence. It doesn't matter whether you're English, Afrikaans, Zulu, Isikosa. Violence is central to the way in which we behave, we think, we respond. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, it's important. I need, think we need to be thinking about what it is that we need to do to protect children from the circumstances that lead them down these kinds of paths. And the one big thing that arises is what do parents do with their children when they have to go out and work or look for work? Mm -hmm. who, who looks after the children in that context? And why have we not been addressing that actively? Mm 
Yeah. So that's one of the things we need so, to take um, into. You, you're really identifying a, a, a set of, a, a very important issue is that it's one thing to, to punish criminals, but that means they've already harmed someone. And what you're wanting to do is to say, let's try and stop the harm even happening in the first place. And not only st stop them harming someone else, but stop them getting harmed in a way that allows them to become people who, who are able to, to be violent towards others. And one of the things you're identifying now is that the, the neglect, the, the fact that these kids are unsupervised, uh, in this particular case a young man feeling unloved as a child, feeling unwanted by his own mother. Um, what, what other kind of um, important issues arose? I just want to quickly stick with that for one second because there was one other man that I interviewed for whom this was a central component of his narrative, not one that he identified. But it, it was a white, it was the only white offender that I interviewed and he was incarcerated for having brutally beaten his brother to death. And after a long career of uh, crime, not, al not always violent crime, but he'd been a sex worker, he'd been a drug dealer, he'd been all sorts of a thief. Um, but central to his story is the fact that his mother never wanted him. She said, I didn't like him from the day he was born. And she beat him from the time he was very small. In fact, at some point he wasn't responding to her beatings any longer. And when he was nine years old, she called in the police uh, to come and beat him in the home. Wow. Um, and did they do that? And they, well, they did come in. <laughs> they did. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think he was seen by a school psychologist. He was put into a reformatory, a very brutalizing institution. In fact, all the boys, all the men I interviewed who had been boys and who had been in reformatories were brutalized far worse than anybody else that I had encountered. Um, although they didn't identify that brutalization themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your last point? Because you were on the white guy mm -hmm. who was in the reform school. Mm -hmm. And it was just about how the fact that he was never wanted or loved by uh, his mother yeah. or anybody. I mean, yeah. he was actually, there was, okay, there is a point, okay, mm. all right, okay. Okay, okay um, so d just to cut back to this story of this, um, this guy who had brutally beaten his brother to death and had been through reform school, where, which, which had been very brutal for him. Um, tell us more about that, that case. Well, I think the important thing in that case, and in almost all other cases, with perhaps one exception, is that for none of these men, while they were growing up, was there ever even one adult they could turn to, to have a conversation about anything meaningful in their lives. Their own feelings were never something that the adults around them took into consideration. Most of them had either lost something big, loss of the love of a parent, lost an actual parent through death, been moved away from parents or caregivers. There'd been a, either loss or betrayal, mm -hmm. a sense that your parent has betrayed you either by um, not, it, not sticking to what they said they would do yeah. or by going off with somebody else or by beating your, your father, beating your mother, mm -hmm. there was some sense of betrayal. They'd yeah. also all experienced violence at home, mm -hmm. they'd experienced violence at school, mm -hmm. and it was kind of what they were adapting to. Mm -hmm. So for most of the men I spoke to, violence wasn't a choice, it was an adaptation. They were doing what you would logically do in a situation. So they were both experiencing a lot of violence around them. The violence was a kind of normal way of people interacting with each other. But they also weren't really experiencing being cared for. They weren't really experiencing that emotional connection that, that sort of allows empathy to develop, allows you to, to care about people, allows you to not want to harm other people. But those seem to be really strikingly absent in these stories. They also didn't have emotional vocabulary. Mm. So it was really hard to get them to speak about how they felt about something mm. and I tried not to push that even mm. I think it was more important to notice that that language was absent yeah. but they never spoke about themselves as emotional mm. beings it really raises the question I mean what could we be doing as a society to be helping men be more articulate and insightful about their emotions you know I think there's 
often an, a, a sense that when you're raising a boy, mm -hmm. they don't need as much love, a care, or attention because they're not as vulnerable as girls. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a boy, it can get on and do whatever they do. Yeah. Boys do what they do. Yeah. Um, and they also don't need as much monitoring and supervision because we're not so worried about what will happen to them because they can take care of themselves. And I think that's a really big mistake. We're mm -hmm. not equipping boys to understand their emotions, to speak about their emotions, to share their emotions with others. And almost none of the men that I interviewed had any warm, loving relationships with intimate partners either. They didn't conceive of themselves as lovable beings. Mm. They didn't know what that looked like or what it would feel like. Yeah. And perhaps they're not, they didn't know how to really love other people. No, I mean, having never experienced it at mm. all, I don't think they, they had any model for what that might be like. So, I mean, apart from these stories being just incredibly interesting stories of people's lives, they really make us rethink how we think about, about people who are dangerous to other people. Um, because our, our, our reflex is to just think about how to get rid of them, how to separate them from ourselves to, to make ourselves safe. But you seem to be doing something more interesting than that, in the sense that you're saying that, well, if we can, if we can understand how they came into being, how they became to be that person rather than anyone else. We can, we can engage in, in, in much more important preventative work. We can prevent these downward spirals, these, these incidents that eventually erupt into violence. Um, so in, in summary, what, what, what are your key points to people out there about what, what are the main things we need to do to try and to engage in this sort of prevention? Well, I think the first thing is we need to understand that this isn't only up to the government. Mm. This is not something that the government alone can fix or has the tools to fix. Mm. In fact, government's tools for dealing with this are quite blunt, which is not to say that government doesn't have a significant role to play here, because if we're going to address this, the structural conditions, poverty, mm. inequality, violence in schools, these kinds of things government can do something about and needs to be doing something about, especially violence in reformatories, for example, that still remain, on the whole, very brutal places. Yeah. So we need to have more school psychologists, and we need those psychologists to understand that when a child expresses bad behavior, they mustn't just focus on that behavior, but understand what is happening in that child's life more generally, mm -hmm. and look towards longer term interventions, and we're just not putting our money there. Yeah. We're putting our money into police while we don't have enough school psychologists. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing, but I think also importantly, we must understand as South African citizens that we all have a role to play in recreating the conditions, and by being hateful, being angry, calling for retribution, calling for longer prison sentences as a response to crime, we're perpetuating the very system that creates yeah. violent men. Yeah, that, that's a really strong critique because that means you've got to completely change the way we think about it. And, and I think certainly for me, reading, reading the stories, these are such powerful life stories and, 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 and so shocking in a way that it, you, you, it really shifts your understanding of your relation to other people who may be threatening to you. And I think it gives us a lot of ways forward. So um, thanks for talking today and thanks for the book. I mean, I think it's a book that is of huge interest to South Africans um, in terms of this fundamental problem of, of trying to do something about our violent society. Thanks very much. And Good. the book is freely oh. available. Yeah, you can, can download, download it. it. Um, uh, so great, get out there and read. Thanks, Good. Anthony. Okay.